Welcome to Prog Rock Digital. Hi everyone and welcome back to another episode of Prog Rock Digital. This is episode one of season two. Our special guest today is Nick DiVirgilio. Nick has worked with Genesis, we cover off on Tears for Fears, Spock's Beard, and we also chat about Big Big Train, and also his solo album Invisible that's out now. We're back just after this quick break. The man behind some of the most iconic pieces of art connected to some of the biggest names in rock, Ioannis. Originally from Athens, Greece, in the last 36 years has created over 300 record covers. For such clients as... King Crimson, Fate's Warning, Uriah Heap, Allman Brothers, Blue Oyster Cult, Leonard Skinner, Ingve Malmsteen, Deep Purple, Styx, just to name a few. Be sure to connect with Ioannis at www.dangerousage.com. Nick DiVigilio, welcome to Prog Rock Digital. How are you, man? Good, man. Thank you for having me, man. It's good to be here. Appreciate it. Thanks for your time, Nick. I know that you're a busy man. What uh, what part of the USA are you dialing in from? Fort Wayne, Indiana. So I'm in the Midwest, in the middle of the country. I'm like three hours by car from a lot of places. Three hours east of Chicago, uh, three hours west of Cleveland. Detroit's just above me, Indianapolis. So right in this sort of like little pocket right there. So Nick, you're originally from uh, California, Los Angeles. Why the move to, um, yeah, to Indiana? Yeah, I'm, I'm from Los Angeles. Yeah, I'm born and raised out there. That's still home for the most part, but I moved out to Indiana for this job that I have at this place called Sweetwater. It's the biggest online music retailer in the country. It just happens to be in this town because that's where the, it's the owner's hometown is Fort Wayne, Indiana. So we came here for the job. Now, Nick, we'll, we'll touch on that soon. Your family roots lay firm in Italy. Um, when did you first make your parents aware of the fact that you wanted to take music seriously and essentially, you know, be a full-time musician. Um, how did they, you know, entertain that? What were some of the hurdles and how did you go about that? Uh, very open. My dad bought me a drum kit when I was five years old. And uh, I've been basically been playing ever since. In fact, I mean, I think I had like a toy drum kit before that, but like a proper, he bought me a, a set of 1965 uh, Ludwig Blue Sparkles. Um, so like a proper drum kit, I was, I was this small compared to a drum kit that was huge. You know, it was like way above at my chin, could barely sit down at the throne and play it. But, um, and I really literally set up drums in the bedroom next to my parents' bedroom and played till I was, you know, 16, 17 years old and left the house. So they were very, uh, they were very supportive and uh, good with it. So Nick, tell us about your time in Tears for Fears. Now, Tears for Fears, um, you know, was, was a, really big band here in Australia and they, they had some hits here. Obviously, you know, the experience would have been amazing. You would have been playing in front of large crowds. You would have had some, some, some really healthy uh, recording time in studios with the band. What was that like? And how did you go about getting the gig? It was truly, it was a huge experience for me. Um, I got the gig because I was friends and in a band with the previous drummer a guy named Brian. His name is Brian McLeod. Amazing player, great guy. He played on all of Sheryl Crow's early records, was one of the main songwriters for Sheryl Crow in the early days. All they want to do is have some fun, that kind of stuff. And in a bunch of other bands um, as well. He's a killer session drummer. And um, I met him through a guy named Kevin Gilbert. And we became friends. We started this band called Caviar, made a record. And um, uh, Brian played on the Elemental tour and then played on the record Raul and the Kings of Spain. And when it was time to go out on that tour, he and Kevin, he didn't want to, he wanted to stay home and, and pursue this original band. Um, he was really into it. We were, it was a really cool thing, but you know, I was still an up and coming new musician. And um, he basically recommended me. I got the gig site on scene on uh, Brian's recommendation. And uh, that just kind of all fell into place. So it was a total who, you know, thing. And then and once I got the gig with, with uh, Tears for Fears, I was played with them for 15 years. And it, this leads me to my, uh, my next question. How important is, you know, forging relationships and, 
you know, just, just maintaining connection with musos within your circles and, you know, uh, within the scene. H- how pivotal is that for today's musicians? It's huge. Oh, it's, it's massive. That's how, that's how everything happens. Um, you know, it, it's all, it, it's not even getting gigs. I mean, you could be in a band, but as long as you know the right people above you and management and this, that, and the other, that'll help your band uh, go up a different level and, and achieve more. If you're a player and you want to just get bigger and better gigs, the more players you know, the more things happen. So it's taught, who you know is a huge part. You, athlete, you obviously have to have your, your stuff together and be a good player and have your gear together and be a good person, show up on time and do all those kind of basic things in life like you do with any job. But um, yeah, who you know is a massive, is it's a huge part of it. Networking, you know, and we all share, you know, music is a very, it's a family oriented thing. Even, you know, we all share stuff. We share how we play instruments. We share uh, how to teaching people how to do, become a better player. And it's the same when you go from gig to gig to gig. At least it should be that way. And the majority of us it that way. There's, there's exceptions where people are, do, don't do the right thing and you get the, the one-off jerk in the business that's for sure there's a lot of there's there is some like that out there but um if you do the right thing and you know you you know you uh you try hard and all that kind of stuff good things will should come your way it definitely happened for me that way now spock's beard um you know obviously the band influenced a lot of uh, musicians and bands in the mid uh, 90s early 2000s how was it working with neil morse i was great i mean you know Dude's a super prolific writer. Um, he was a little bit of a different guy back then, you know, pre, pre his life changed in the early 2000s a little bit, but um, he's really the same person. I shouldn't really say that. He's the same guy, just different philosophy. Um, and um, yeah, it was great. We had a great time. It was cool because there was we were in a band that playing music that we thought was dead, at least in California. You know, Prague was really on the on the back burner. And we all grew up with it, but, you know, people were in grunge and listening to Nirvana and, and all kinds of other bands like that. And it was just, I had no idea there was even a scene until we played Prog Fest. And well, until I met Neil and he said, I wrote a prog rock record and we're looking to put a band together and the music was good. So, you know, it turned out to be a really cool thing. And we had a lot of good years together. You know, it's interesting, uh, back in the late nineties, when I was, um, you know, uh, visiting a, uh, a music store in Melbourne, uh, actually called Metal for Melbourne. Um, I, I basically asked them, I said, look, what are the top three um, prog bands that you would recommend? And they gave me three names, Queensryche, Dream Theatre, and Spock's Beard. There you go. And that pretty much covers the uh, the environment in a nutshell, if you like, for at least back then anyway. Um, it must have been, sure. you know, an exciting thing, uh, you know, forming this band and, you know, watching it sort of progress. Yeah, it was me. It was it was Neil and Alan. Neil wrote the music and his brother, Alan. I met them at a blues jam in, in L.A. one night. And a couple days later, Alan, was, Alan put together a networking sort of jam session at a rehearsal studio. We went there and I, we played and jammed and, and stuff. And then Neil said, yeah, I wrote this music. Why don't you come by and grab a cassette? We used to listen to cassettes. And uh, uh, that was the start of the band. Yeah, so like, yeah. Mm. So, so one of the only bands I've ever been in to start from the very beginning. You yeah, know? yeah. So you have since revisited through. the band since, though. I mean, it's um, you know, it, it, you've gone back in some form. Yeah, well, we're still all friends. We still keep in touch. All those kinds of things. You know, I left the band when I joined Cirque du Soleil because I I just wasn't around. I couldn't make the band wait around for me and not know when I was going to come back. And my schedule was really wacky and stuff. And I had to provide for the family and stuff, so I couldn't. I didn't expect them to to hang and just wait for me. So that was the reason I left the first time. Well, the reason I left because of that. And Jimmy took on from me and uh, kicked ass. He's a great drummer and Ted's singing. So they did made a lot of great records. And then I, they came to visit me at Sweetwater and we did a recording workshop. And then I got to record on the noise floor record. And uh, that was, you know, it was great to work with those guys again. So Circus Disolay, I mean, this is a dream job for a muso. You would have played 1,500-odd gigs, um, you know, steady income, uh, you know, weekly pay, oh. no issues yeah. whatsoever. You're basically on the road. You're playing full-time. Yeah, yeah. And I would have been in Australia. What happened was is the reason I left Cirque 
Um, so I traveled around the world and the country, mostly in the, the Western hemisphere with, you know, the States, Canada, and Europe with my family kids. My kids got schooled through Cirque. And when we first left, my kids were 10 and 12. So it was all, we all left and joined the circus. And um, it was cool. We got to live about four months, three, four months in each city. You know, we weren't moving every day. So we got to like live in these towns and learn about them and stuff. And towards the end, they were making a bunch of corporate cutbacks and they closed the school option. That was one of the huge benefits that mine and I think six other shows had traveling schools, but they closed down the schools to save money. So that was my ticket out. I had done the show about 1500 times by that point and stuff. And so it was time to, to move on because I, I could have kept my job. They didn't fire me. I could, but I would have to figure out how to school my kids. And the next, the, so we finished in Vancouver, Canada, and the show right after that went to New Zealand for six months and Australia for a year. So I would have been able to live down there for a year and a half and I missed it all, which really sucks because I would love to, I've never been able to see down there yet. And um, I have family in Melbourne, a lot of Italians on my, on my mother's side of the family all live down in Brisbane and uh, Melbourne. And um, she, you know, it would have been killer to live down there and, and experience that your country, but unfortunately, so, but that's why we left Cirque. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Nick, if we go back a little, um, you're a massive Genesis fan. Um, you essentially take, or you're, you're one of two drummers, percussionists that take Phil Collins's spot and you record the, uh, calling all stations album. How were you able to take the, fan out of Nick DiVigilio and if you like uh, look at this from a band member perspective or a hired gun perspective how were you yeah. able to you know disenfranchise yourself from that psyche it was it was weird it was tough but it wasn't it actually was once I met Tony Banks and Mike Rutherford at the studio for the first time um they're really mellow guys uh, at least they were when I hung out with them and um it was really easy to hang out at the, I mean, there was no, it was, it, it brought the nerves down and all that kind of stuff, you know, and the, just made it really easy going. Like I was in the studio, which is another group of dudes making music. And it really was just like that. Um, they're just normal guys, you know, they just happen to be really successful, <laughs> you know, and part of my favorite band of all time. So um, uh, once I got past that, you know, and they just, you know, they wrote some cool tunes. They, they wanted me to just play like me. They didn't, they said, don't play like Phil. Don't try to be Phil. Just go do your thing was really easy in, in that respect you know it was cool being in phil collins drum room and in their studio and hanging out and seeing them behind the glass that's for sure um and we got to listen to their stories about the old days and stuff and when they wanted to talk about it and um so it was um it actually wasn't that hard to do to take the fan away thing because they were just i was hanging out with some other some some guys playing music so nick we'll touch on sweetwater now um you are the face of the company, if you like, in social media circles. You have videos on YouTube, Facebook, and so forth. You're trying yeah. products. You're, you're sampling things. You're reviewing products. It it must must be an amazing feeling being able to have access to so many products, and you know, it's essentially, crazy. you know, being able to use them on call whenever you like, on demand. I guess looking at it, you know, and, and putting it into perspective, you're you're essentially selling marketing, promoting products on behalf of Sweetwater, and you know, you're a kid in a candy store, and you're being paid for this, but it probably doesn't even feel like you're being. It doesn't even feel like you're working. <laughs> um, how did you go about getting the role? The reason, the way I got the job was, as my Cirque du Soleil job was ending, I needed to find work and figure out what I'm going to do with my life. And my one of my best friends in the world named Mark Hornsby is a recording engineer and producer uh, was running the recording studios at Sweetwater. Sweetwater is, Sweetwater is like this huge campus here in this town. It's this big, huge facility. There's a, there are those recording studios and theaters and a, and a concert venue outside, like an outdoor concert uh, tent to hold about 3000 people. And there's a restaurant in it and a gym and a doctor and a, and a salon. I mean, all this stuff. It's like six, 700 salespeople and a 500,000 square foot warehouse. It's, it's just massive complex, like a kind of a Google style complex. And um, he was running the recording studios at the time. He's not, he's no longer there, but um, he basically um, went to bat. Cause he was trying to build a team of players at the recording studio to have like a, 
sort of like the old school, old school sort of Muscle Shoals thing where you have players, producers, songwriters, call all in, in-house and people could come and hire all of the services and to make a record. Um, and so he was building that. So I, he, he brought me along to be the house drummer and do lots of vocals and stuff and some engineering. And then the other half of my job was to do like the social media stuff like you see, do web content and get to basically uh, – review and play new gear and do how-to videos and that kind of stuff. So I have, the, I have a two-pronged job. So half of it is doing that social media stuff and half of it is working in the recording studios. Yeah, and playing with all that gear is ridiculous, dude. I mean, <laughs> the place, we have all the major brands and, and a bunch of boutique brands too that aren't, you know, aren't like huge game players, but you know, they're like expensive boutique kind of stuff. And we get to play with all of it. Cause it's our job to do the reviews and the how to videos and the demo videos to show off the gear. So people might be interested in buying it. So we get to mess with all of this new stuff all the time. It's like Disneyland for gear. Yeah. You are one lucky, uh, lucky man. For sure. For sure. Yeah. So purely from a recording standpoint, do you find it, you know, instinctively, if you like, you tend to move or gravitate towards a certain manufacturer or vendor uh, when it comes to your setup, can you give us an example of, of this? All of the above. All the above. So, um, so like for my solo record, we got all of the, we got together in and worked with a bunch of the vendors that we do business with. So like DW and Gretsch and Tama and Pearl and Mapex and Ludwig and so on. And they sort of sponsored the record. So I, de- I, I literally picked a different drum kit for every song and kind of molded the sound of the drums to the, the vibe of the song. That's pretty unusual. That doesn't normally happen when you make a record. You might have like one set of drums and a bunch of snare drums. You like change out snare drum sounds and the drums, the toms and stuff sort of stay. Um, That said, we have a huge collection of stuff in our studio. So someone comes in for a session and I I listen what style of music it it is. And then I'll sort of pick the, the sound of the drums to kind of fit their particular style of music. And I'm spoiled in that, in that respect. So we have a bunch of different drum kits made of different woods and stuff, all the different manufacturers. And we can, we can pick and choose. Sometimes we mix and match stuff. You don't have to have the same brand all the time. And same with cymbals and all that kind of stuff. So it just depends on the music. And yeah, we're spoiled to be able to kind of pick and choose what we want to use. And that goes for guitars and guitar amps and basses and stuff and keyboards. We kind of, same goes for all the different instruments as well. So Nick, you're a, a self-taught muso. Would I be right in saying that? Mostly. No, I mean, I was self-taught until I was about 18. And then I went to music school. So I did two years of music school after, after high school. That was the first time I started taking proper lessons. And I've been studying ever since, since then. Yeah, so now I, I, yeah, I, I love the educational part of it and, and learning about uh, all kinds of different things. So you released your solo debut 20 years ago, Karma. And... Now you've just released yeah. Invisible. Can I ask, why the 20-year wait? Can you elaborate on that and give us some uh, insight? Well, the only reason really was I was doing a million different things and fitting that in. A, at that time, I had two, two young kids, one and two years old, that kind of thing. I was in Spock's Beard. I was in Tears for Fears. And I was, and I was doing other things as well freelancing with other bands playing with Mike Keneally and Fate's Warning and doing all just all kinds of different things so find the time to make solo records too there was just so many not so many hours in the there wasn't enough hours in the day I should say right and it sort of just kind of fell on the back burner and I always wrote I wrote for Spock's Beard because at that time um, I became the lead singer so this my songwriting sort of went towards Spock's Beard because we wanted to keep the band going and uh we were all writing at that point. So I kind of focused my attention and my writing towards the band and not me as a solo artist. And also last, another thing I could say is I think my writing has just progressively gotten better as I've gotten older too. So it was kind of a maturity process happening as it was going. Um, yeah. Now at this point I'm writing a ton and I got plans for records, a lot of records get going forward from this point. So it's just taken me a while to get here. But, you know, all that said, I was just in, I was in bands. So all of my, all of my attention went, went to the bands that I was in. So once we're out of COVID and, you know, things are back to normal or, you know, there is a, a level of normality um, in our schedules, if you like, what's in the cards for Nick DiVigilio in terms of, you know, pushing the Invisible album and 
you know, marketing of that? Uh, whatever I can do, to be quite honest with you. I'm doing a few live streams and there's like a live at Sweetwater I'm planning on doing at the beginning of the year. So whatever I can do as far as just putting stuff out on the web to keep people engaged. But once I can get out there, I'm going to, you know, I have a little band together from here in, in Indiana, but we'll see how it goes when I need to kind of start traveling. But I'm planning on going out there and playing as many gigs as I can, wherever I can play and where people will show up. I have some live dates planned for Big Big Train. There's a few, just three dates in the summer, some festivals next summer. But then we're really, we're really supposed to get back going again in 2022 uh, with a lot more touring. So Big Big Train is predominantly a uh, UK band. Yeah. Although it's starting to spread now. It's starting to spread because with the popularity of the band, it's starting to, to we're starting to kind of get the, our, our, our sound out to the rest of the world. So how is it uh, crossing over to the UK for recording, rehearsals, starting off tours and so forth? Uh, there must be a ton of uh, back and forth. That's great. I mean, it's much easier to get over there, right, from where I'm at. It's, only, it's about a six-hour flight. It's not that big a deal. So I go, I go over to, the, to England when there's not a freaking pandemic going on, uh, you know, two, three times a year, to be quite honest with you. So we go over there and record, and we, were doing some, we did our first proper tour. It was all in the UK, but we did our tour last October, a year ago. And we have a live DVD coming out at the end of this month on, from, the, from the last show of that tour when we played in London. So we're excited about that. And then we're, I start recording for a new record at the end of this month as well. And the new record will be out next summer, around June or so. So a lot of, there's a lot of stuff going on with Big Big Train. So from a technical perspective, how do you pull it off whereby you're, mm -hmm. you're drumming and singing at the same time? And mind you, we're talking odd time signatures, seven, yep. nines, elevens, fifteens. How do you have four limbs working? You're singing in tune, you're singing uh, in key, and you're singing, you know, essentially in sync with what you're playing and, you know, playing to a click. Do you actually play to a click or is that just a case-by-case -case, uh, situation or scenario? Sometimes. It depends. Yeah, sure. Sometimes. How how is all that possible? <laughs> it's crazy. I mean, it's probably like like driving. You don't even realize you're doing it or where you've been. I don't know, man. The brain is an amazing thing. How it make it tells you what your body what to do. Um, I, the only really way to answer it is I've been doing it for a really long time. So I try to get to the point. Sometimes it's really hard. Some songs are harder than others. Um, even some songs in four are harder to play and sing than to, it's an, an odd one. It just depends on the track, you know. And, um, you just, I've been, I've been playing drums since I was four or five years old. So it's just a lot of that stuff comes out naturally once I learn the part. So I don't have to think about that as much. You concentrate more on learning, keeping the lyrics in your head and singing in pitch and that kind of stuff. And it just comes from doing it. There's really nothing, no other way to answer that question. Um, and, and, you know, the human body and the brain is capable of doing that kind of crazy thing. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. You, it's like five things at once, six things at once, but it's somehow it works. And there's some guys out there in the world doing crazier things than just singing and playing drums where they have, there's a guy named uh, Nate West who plays, he's got a drum kit around him with a key. It's, it's a small drum kit with cymbals, snare kick and all that kind of stuff. And a little keyboard or two keyboards right, right here where his floor tom would be. And he plays bass guitar and sings. And he's kind of dropping the bass, playing one handed on the bass and playing with the drums with his right hand. And he'll go to a keyboard and then switch back and forth. And I'm talking to talk about doing this kind of thing. It's insane. And he's doing really intricate rhythms and things like that. So, you know, people can do all kinds of wacky stuff. So, Nick, I forgot to mention and, and wish you a happy birthday for um, for last week, November the 12th. Oh, now, thanks, man. Thank you. You're, you're in your early 50s. How have things changed from when you first kicked off as a, a muso, a full-time musician? How has, you know, apart from technology, um, what – is, is something that you can uh, give our listeners and, if anything, prep the muso moving forward with? Is there anything that stands out and that is, you know, uh, thought-provoking, if you like? Well, you know, the whole the, – the, the, we're in this, the digital age that we're in definitely makes it different than it was even back in the 90s when I was sort of making – coming up. You still had to sell records – you know, you made records to tour to sell the records and, and you tour to promote the records. Now you, you tour to promote the band. The record is just sort of like entices people to come see you play live. It's just a different model now. And, and you have to learn how to adapt to the, today's day and age. 
um, of streaming and all of those kinds of things. But, you know, and there's good and bad points on both sides. But what's really good is that, you know, it makes the, the whole world is available to all of us now. You know, you're in Australia, you're thousands and thousands of miles away from me. And we're talking to each other on video and on audio right now. And you could turn on your computer and listen to my music right now, you know, and then maybe dig it so much you just hit go to my store and buy my record. I mean, so that's there's instantaneous <coughs> uh, commerce that can happen immediately for bands that couldn't happen in the past. You had to there's something to be said for being able to have to, have to go and search out things and hear stuff on the radio and who was that and then do some research. I mean, there was there's really cool things about that. and. Um, yeah, totally. So, but the fact, you know, that you can um, get turned on to so much great music, world music that you would have almost never heard of in the past because of technology is, um, it's amazing. So you can really, you know, I, I, I always marvel at when I look on my little Spotify analytics thing every month to see who's listening and it'll, it'll break down, not the exact person, but how many people are listening to you in different parts of the world. And I got people listening to my music in the Middle East and then all over South America and Southeast Asia and stuff. And it's like, so, you know, that you're, the fact that you're entertaining people and touching people in so many distant corners of the world and you live in one little spot. To me, that's incredible, right? Now, there's arguments to be made for how much money people, bands get paid for, you know, for stream, how it's much less and all that kind of stuff. And I get that. Believe me, I want to make money, too, and support my family. So that's a different argument. But the fact that you can touch other people that live so far away from you instantly is it's absolutely amazing. So, Nick, in the interest of time, please spruik, uh, if you can, your most recent release, Invisible. You've obviously got it out through Sweetwater. Um, yeah. Whom is it out through in terms of distribution and how can people get a hold of it? Yeah, in Invisible is there's through Sweetwater. It's called Sweetwater Studios. That's sort of the record label. And Entertainment One is the distribution company for the states and uh, digitally around the world. Eng the English Electric, which is part of Big Big Train, is putting it out in Europe and stuff. But you can go right to my store, nickdivergilio.com, and you can buy the record there. You can go on Bandcamp. Uh, you can get it in a number of different ways. If you want the physical copies, just go to my store order, and we'll ship it to you wherever you are. doesn't matter. And uh, But if you want to just listen to it digitally, uh, Spotify, all the normal streaming sites have it. And, um, and YouTube might go to my YouTube channel. There's lots of videos going up all the time, Instagram, all the kind of normal social places, Facebook and everything. Nick, thank you very much for partaking in this interview. It's been an absolute pleasure. Hopefully we can chat soon. Well, that was our interview with Nick DiVigilio. Thank you very much for downloading and tuning in. Don't forget to visit our new and revamped website, progrockdigital.com. Until next time, stay safe.